Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming even the holiday. And uh, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Anand Rajaraman. I think many of you would already have heard about Anand, but I thought I'll tell you a little bit about his uh, background. Uh, Anand is a B.Tech from IIT in Madras, and uh, then he did his uh, PhD at Stanford with uh, Jeff Alman. And uh, during his PhD, um, Anand did some fantastic research. Uh, you would have heard of Anand as a uh, entrepreneur starting companies and so forth. What you probably haven't heard of is that uh, he did such excellent work during his PhD in a short span. The three of his papers won uh, the test of time award. That is, ten years later, after a conference, uh, people look at papers published in that conference and say which papers after ten years have had the most impact on the field. And three of his papers have won that award, and at three different conferences: BLDB, Sigma, and ICD. Which is <laughs> after this, he was doing in his spare time because in his. Uh, in his mainline time, he was busy starting uh, this company called Jungli. Uh, the younger ones here may not have heard of, uh, but uh, older people would have. Uh, which he sold to Amazon, uh, then worked with Amazon. Then he was doing a uh, uh, venture capital uh, firm. And then he started this company called Cosmix, which is probably one of the coolest companies you've never heard of. Uh, because uh, they pioneered things which you see appearing on Google today. On Google, uh, when you search, you see the usual links, but you also see these uh, factoids on the right, which are increasingly popular. Uh, Cosmics had that uh, about 12, 11, 12 years ago, yeah. of course, more than 10 years back. Cosmics pioneered this. Um, uh, so they went on to do other stuff on product search and they sold to Walmart. Uh, and now uh, Anand is a full time venture uh, business. And here's some amazing insights into all of the stuff which has happened and is going to happen. Uh, so it's a pleasure to welcome him back. And by the way, for those of you who are doing your PhD, uh, Anand dropped out of his PhD, but went back and finished it uh, later. Uh, so that's uh, quite a nice commitment to research. There's some fun stuff we're going to hear. But before Anand uh, takes over, uh, Dr. Patek wanted to say a few words. Sorry to take your time, but I just couldn't resist the temptation of saying something for Anand. Uh, Sudarshan mentioned his dropping out of PhD, so I start. There are a fairly good number of people at Stanford, particularly, who have established a a, a new uh, terminology called ABT. It's called all but thesis. So they do substantial amount of PhD, but drop out because of other lures in Bay Area. Uh, one of which is, of course, uh, starting up a company. There's a higher kind of thing. The others are good offers from other major companies and so on. So there are many such people, including some of our own gold medalists, by the way, who never finished their PhD. So Anand is made of thunder stuff. He did that. Uh, I recall the days when I set up the IT business incubator where a whole lot of youngsters uh, attempted to start their companies. Several succeeded, some did not. But there was a big debate at that point in time that to become an entrepreneur, you need completely different kinds of skills and technical knowledge is not necessarily a important element of what you do. That has been proven as nonsense many times over. In fact, when Dr. Swas Patil had come here, he mentioned how he was not only a great researcher but a teacher and when he set up his company, extraordinary amount of cutting-edge technology was required in whatever he was doing. Same is the case that is proven by Anand time and again. So he has been using cutting-edge technology in whatever he does and therefore cutting-edge technology, high-end research and entrepreneurship are not at all mutually exclusive. In fact, they are completely inclusive and that is the message that I wanted to give you. So when you interact with Anand, bug him not only on the research problems, but bug him on how he has successfully translated the technology innovations into the businesses. That is one thing. The second important point that I learned from the interaction that I had in BLDB is that uh, while the uh, field of researchers is actually frittered because of the silos that we built around ourselves 
by giving different nomenclatures such as database, networking, artificial intelligence and whatever, whatever. In real life, when you have challenging problems to sort, all these silos need to merge with competencies across these silos necessarily required in actually coming up with an innovative solution. This is another thing that he has proven himself and I think he articulates it well when he describes the data-driven revolution that is happening. So, please listen to him very carefully and bug him as much as you can before he runs away because his time is important. But I hope that we will all benefit tremendously by getting a different view of life when he talks about the data I will I will not steal his thunder anymore. Unfortunately, I have to rush back to some urgent work as usual, but I wanted to say these few lines. Thank you so much, and thank you very much, Anand, for sparing time and coming here. Uh, thanks, Sudarshan and Professor Patak for the uh, kind words of introduction. And um, I thought it would be, you know, um, an interesting uh, segue. When I, when I um, arrived here, I drove, uh, drove in uh, from, from Bandra and, uh, and I, I texted uh, Sudarshan who had kindly invited me saying, I'll be here at, uh, at 11.15 at the campus. Um, and lo and behold, I was here exactly at 11.15 and, uh, uh, and Sudarshan commented on this and said, you know, how come you, you could predict exactly when you would arrive and given Bombay traffic and so on. Uh, and uh, the secret is simple. I've learned to stop worrying and trust a Google, right? So, uh, and, uh, you know, Google Maps, as we know, is, uh, uses a lot of data to make predictions uh, using, you know, knowing traffic conditions well and often does much better than a local in uh, telling you exactly when you're going to reach. And that's actually a microcosm of, of the theme of this talk, right? Uh, you know, sometimes data is better than humans, right? And humans and data need to love, uh, you know, learn to work together and love each other. So that's kind of the, uh, the, the broader theme of this talk. Uh, this is a talk that I um, uh, put together for um, a conference, uh, the BLDB conference in, in Delhi uh, for, for a keynote. And it's sort of directed at an audience of uh, researchers and um, uh, haven't had the time to actually modify the talks, uh, you know, since it just happened a few days ago. So uh, apologies for that. And I'll try to sort of uh, make this more relevant to students as I go along uh, and, uh, you know, whenever possible. Otherwise, please bear with me. So uh, the title of the talk uh, is uh, is data driven uh, disruption, right? So um, and uh, what do I mean by data driven uh, disruption? Um, and so there's there's sort of lots of examples of um, of this this uh, phenomena all around us. By by disruption, I mean a sudden or abrupt change in the status quo of something, usually for the better, right? So um, and. Uh, you know, and there's there's plenty of interesting things like uh, like online recommendations or uh, uh, the uh, b the AlphaGo beating the the Go champion um, or or self-driving cars or uh, uh, bots or intelligent assistants, things of this nature, which are uh, things of this this nature. These are sun uh, these are abrupt changes in the status quo, usually for the better. And behind all these kinds of innovations that have happened in the last ten years or so. Uh, there's uh, there's data. Data is what's driving all these all these massive disruptions that are happening around us, and we see uh, see this happening, uh, you know, uh, quite regularly these days. And so when when you see something of this nature, right, you want to step back uh, and ask why is this happening? Um, and of course, the reason this is happening is that there's a lot more data in the world now, right? So uh, the the amount of data in the world is growing at some insane rate. It's growing fifty uh, x. Uh, over a decade, and it's probably an underestimate. It probably is actually growing faster. Um, and these numbers are kind of hard to uh, to comprehend. What is you know 40 zettabytes, right? So we, it's hard for us to imagine uh, what that means. So I'll I'll use a little kind of factoid uh, that might bring this to uh, you know br bring this to light. Uh, and uh, and this factoid is that for the first time, right? Uh, people who work with data have more stuff to study than astronomers, right? Uh, now there's there's more bits of data in the digital universe now than there are stars in the in the physical universe. So uh, so if you want to you know study lots of things, be a data scientist rather than an astronomer. So there's tons of data, um, and and where is this data coming from? Well, it's coming from many different places. Uh, a lot of it is coming from uh, from our camera phones um, and uh, you know various sensors that are embedded in our mobile devices. 
um, uh, some a lot of it is uh, streaming video, uh, things like Amazon Prime and Netflix. A lot of it is uh, coming from satellites in the sky, um, lots of digital imagery. Um, and tons of it is coming from things like Internet of Things embedded in, uh, in machinery and so forth. So overall, we're creating tons of data, 1.7 megabytes of per data per minute per person. That's, that's a lot of data. Uh, and it's orders of magnitude more than uh, what we were doing just a decade ago, right? So, so this is, there's lots of it and it's growing very, very fast. And so when you have tons of data, uh, what do we do? We use this data to do interesting things, right? Um, and uh, so uh, we, we've created a new class of applications over the last uh, 10 or 15 years uh, that, that I'll call data-driven applications, right? Um, so a, a data-driven application is uh, just an application that uses data to uh, do something interesting, <coughs> right? So, so it creates value uh, using, using data. So here's kind of the, uh, the, the outline of this, uh, of this talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the evolution of these uh, data-driven applications over time, over the last uh, two decades or so. Uh, and we'll see that there have been five generations of these data-driven applications over the last uh, several years. And then, uh, then we'll get to the main part of the talk, where I'll talk about uh, lessons and, and opportunities. Um, and um, these, uh, as um, you know, as Sudarshan mentioned, um, my per my perspective is sort of not the usual perspective of most people because I sort of straddle this this uh, thing where I'm not good at any one particular thing. So I'm sort of at the intersection of the startups of venture capital and of uh, of academia. So I'm trying to bring a slightly different perspective that sort of encompasses all these uh, all these different points of view. Um, and um, the, the main people that I'm trying to address uh, are uh, those of you who want to uh, go and start companies, right? So I hope many of you will become entrepreneurs. Um, and hopefully there's something in here uh, for that, you know, that, uh, that gives you some ideas uh, or inspires you to go do that. Uh, and the, and the, other kind of, um, the, the other kind of person I'm addressing is those among you who want to do uh, interesting and relevant research that's motivated by real life problems that, uh, that we face in Silicon Valley these days at the cutting edge of startups, right? So uh, these are the two uh, groups of people that, that I'm addressing here. And, uh, the, and I'll try to sort of uh, mention which one is which, but usually these things overlap. Um, and uh, the key theme uh, that we'll see uh, as we go through the talk is this idea of disruption versus optimization. So just uh, uh, stay tuned for, uh, for that. Okay. So uh, now let's, uh, without further ado, get to the first part of the talk, which is these, uh, this evolution of uh, data-driven applications. So if you sort of think about how data-driven applications have evolved over the last uh, 15 or 20 years, uh, they've sort of evolved with the kinds of data that have been available, right? So, um, and uh, so, you know, it's kind of you sort of look at the most valuable data that, that's available and then build applications to take advantage of it. So let's start with the first generation. Um, so back, this is back about 20, 25 years ago, uh, companies started building these, uh, these databases, um, database systems, and they used it to operate business functions, so to automate business functions like sales and inventory and, uh, and, and payroll. Um, and this is you know, using cl classic uh, SQL uh, queries, which I'm sure uh, many of you have learned. Um, and which I saw some examples of earlier uh, today as well. So, uh, so, so that was the that was the beginning of uh, of companies collecting data in databases uh, just to automate routine business functions. Uh, but you know, but as this data sort of accumulated in these databases, uh, some smart people realized that uh, you know you can use this data not just to uh, to automate sales or inventory or payroll, but actually to create competitive advantages for uh, for the business itself. Um, and that's kind of the origin of uh, you know the earliest kind of data-driven apps, which are things like uh, market basket analysis, uh, right? So this 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 famous uh, if apocryphal example of uh, diapers and beer, which I'm sure some of you uh, may have heard of, uh, sort of originated around this uh, this time. If you don't know what that is, ask me later at the end of this talk. Um, and um, uh, so lots of examples like that. Uh, but the, uh, I'd say the most interesting example of, uh, from the first generation where companies were using essentially data that was gathered for operational reasons to, do interest, to, to build uh, interesting apps uh, is, uh, is recommendation systems, right? So Amazon launched this in the, in the mid-90s. Uh, most of us use this uh, or something like this uh, where uh, you, know, you, can, um, you can use uh, data that uh, the, uh, Amazon uses data that they've gathered 
uh, because of transaction for, for entirely other reasons, but they can use that now to recommend uh, interesting things for people to buy, right? So that's kind of the, I'd say, the most perhaps impactful uh, application of the first generation of uh, data-driven applications. So, uh, so that's the first generation. Now, as the uh, time passed by, um, you know, the World Wide Web uh, was growing, um, and this was now we are kind of in the uh, mid to late 90s. Um, and as, as, as the World Wide Web starts growing, there's now more and more data on the web um, and places like Wikipedia and so on. So we can actually build uh, interesting apps using data that's on the web as opposed to just data that's in private databases. Uh, and most of the many interesting apps were built using just the data that was uh, public data uh, that's available in the in the web, right? Uh, now, my 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 first company, Jungly, was an example of of this nature, where we used uh, uh, we built a comparison shopping engine using publicly available data on the websites of uh, shopping companies. Uh, but I'd say the perhaps the most impactful um, second generation app. Any guesses? Anyone? No. Using entirely public data, web data. Who built the most interesting app? Any ideas? Google, that's right. Um, so Google search is uh, probably the uh, the most uh, most exciting or the most impactful example of using public data to uh, to build a data driven app, and this is something we all use every day. So um, so it's it's hugely impactful, right? So they've harnessed all the world's public data and made it useful. Um, now, as as time passed by, uh, we uh, we had social media. So we had Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest and uh, Instagram and so on. Uh, and so now we have a new class of, of data, which is, uh, which, which is social data. This is neither private data nor is it public data. It's semi-public data. Uh, it's, uh, it's sort of accessible like public data, but it has usage restrictions and so on. Um, and uh, so, th so this is a new kind of data that became available in the uh, uh, first uh, decade of this, uh, this century. Um, and once you had this kind of data, people started building apps using social data as well. Um, and the most interesting apps uh, were apps that were built by the social media companies themselves. Uh, things like uh, friend recommendations, um, um, or uh, you know, this is uh, Twitter's Moments, which builds a newspaper-style experience using, uh, using the latest tweets, um, or, um, uh, or Facebook's uh, feed. Or, or advertising. These are all examples of uh, uh, apps that are built using social data. Uh, now, there have there, there also been uh, some other examples of third-party companies that use this, uh, this kind of data, for example, to look at uh, brands use uh, this company called Crimson Hexagon uh, to track what people are saying about their products uh, you know, on, on social media, and they can use that to react and so on. So that's the third generation. Now, uh, the fourth generation basically combines all these things together, right? People are building apps using public, using this private, and using semi-public. And then uh, some people started combining different kinds of data to build even more interesting apps. So you can combine these kinds of apps, uh, uh, these kinds of data, to build more interesting apps. So, um, so, you can uh, so here's, uh, here's an example. Uh, this is a company called uh, Pesa. Now, um, if you, it's many of the examples I'm going to use uh, are uh, going forward are companies uh, from Silicon Valley. Uh, these are companies uh, in many cases where I, I'm, I'm involved in some way. And the interesting thing is many of these companies have some kind of IIT connection, right? Many of them have IITs as founders. Uh, some of them have IIT Bombay people as founders. Some of them are from other IITs. Uh, PESA is, uh, is, is one example. Um, and I believe uh, one of the founders is from IIT Madras in this case. Um, and um, I, I'll tell you when there's an IIT Bombay founder as well. So. Um, so this uh, this company um, addresses this, uh, this this problem of uh, um, you know am I being paid fairly right I'm, I'm at this company I have all these qualifications uh, are they paying me right should I be making more should you know um, and so this is what Pesa does it um, it sort of makes this uh, this nice distribution that tells you what people with your qualifications uh, are making um, I th you know and um, you know maybe some of you can use this. Uh, you know, when you're uh, doing your campus placements uh, to, uh, to figure out whether you're, you know, being, to evaluate your offers, right? So uh, to see whether the, the offer uh, makes sense and is in the scale. Um, you know, they'll tell you the, uh, the base salary bonus, equity, and signing bonus for people with, uh, with certain kinds of qualifications and, and skills working at, at certain jobs. Now, how do they do this, right? Uh, they do this by combining lots of data. Right? 
Uh, the data consists of da about data about salaries, about people, about companies, and about jobs. Um, and where does this data come from? Uh, this data comes from both private and public sources, right? So there's public sources like uh, like calling the web and social media and local and national government databases, but there's also private data that comes from the companies and from recruiters and uh, and from partnerships. So you put all this together and you can build this really powerful app uh, that uh, that combines public and private data and can do these uh, these salary predictions. Right. So. Uh, now, uh, the fifth generation is, 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 is a generation that's happening right now. It's, it's this uh, new, uh, new it's, it's the latest generation of apps. Um, and it's sort of driven by a new class of data that, uh, that, that's becoming uh, you know, more and more widespread. And this is training data. Now, all of you have heard about uh, AI and the huge buzz about um, you know, uh, uh, using AI to accomplish all kinds of things. Uh, behind all this, of course, uh, is machine learning. Uh, and machine learning uh, requires vast amounts of training data, especially if you're using things like deep learning, right? To train uh, to train models to uh, to do things. So uh, because of this, there's lot there's more and more companies that are generating large amounts of training data uh, just to train uh, just to train models. Um, and this is a new class of proprietary data that's sort of driving the the next generation of of data driven apps. Um, and the uh, uh, many of these, um, uh, you know, uh, much of this training data is actually obtained by humans uh, who are who tag examples and so on. Um, and a lot of them use uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk or other crowdsourcing services uh, to do this. Uh, but also, there's also other ways of uh, creating uh, training data. For example, you could just uh, drive around a car and collect a lot of data, and, that, and then you can use that to train. Um, self-driving cars, for example, right? So, uh, so you can you can collect a lot of training data uh, that way as well. So, just to summarize, the fifth generation uh, consists of uh, all the other kinds of data sources we saw in all the other previous four generations, plus uh, training data, right? So, then now the, then you have the fifth generation app, which is the generation that we're currently in. Um, so, what are some examples? Uh, well, ImageNet was built by asking humans to tag uh, images using Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, and ImageNet was hugely influential and powerful because it sort of uh, deep learning, as we know it, originated using the data that was available on, on ImageNet. So we owe uh, deep learning to, uh, to ImageNet. Um, the self-driving cars, which we've already seen. Um, and the, this one um, is, uh, is Atari Breakout. Um, and this was uh, uh, people who trained um, a machine learning model to play this, uh, this Atari Breakout game. Uh, using this technique called uh, deep reinforcement learning, and there the data was uh, was obtained uh, by actually simulating the game many many times, right? So that's another way of uh, collecting training data by simulating by through simulation, right? So these are all different ways of collecting lots of of training data. Some examples. Okay, so that was the. Uh, uh, the end of my uh, the the piece of the talk on uh, um, on the evolution of data driven applications and the summary is that, is that data driven applications just evolved by following the most interesting data we started with with private data then we had public data uh, then we had social data and finally we have training data right and uh, so so we've had five generations so far now um, I'm sure somebody will, will ask me to predict what the sixth generation is going to be. And I'll tell you upfront, I have no clue, because that depends on the next kind of data that's going to become available. Uh, and uh, when I give this talk three years later, I'll be able to tell you right? So, uh, what, the, what the next generation of data-driven apps is going to be. Right, so that was the end of that piece of the talk. But now we'll move on to this, uh, this section of, on lessons and opportunities. And these come from my perspective uh, in Silicon Valley, uh, and hopefully, uh, is relevant to some people in the audience who want to start companies, right? So I've sort of organized this uh, into five themes. Um, I don't know whether I'll have time to go into all of these, uh, but I'll make the slides available so you can see it later. Uh, I'll at least uh, do the first couple. Uh, the uh, the first the uh, theme is this: uh, is that I wanted to look at the startup and investment landscape around this uh, around data driven. Uh, companies just to see where uh, where where uh, entrepreneurs are starting companies and where investment dollars are flowing, um, and that's not necessarily the best um, gauge of uh, you know or the most useful uh, thing to know uh, is is that you should start companies where other people are starting companies. But at least it's it's a market signal and it's helpful to know. Um, and next, I'm going to talk about this this theme of uh, disruption versus optimization, which is going to be the main theme. Uh, and then uh, perhaps we look at uh, 
human-machine collaboration and, and the rise of the cyborg, uh, de depending on, on time availability. Yeah. So, um, so let's start with the, uh, with the startup and investment uh, landscape. Um, so this is the uh, set of uh, major uh, big data or data-driven companies that have raised venture capital in Silicon Valley. You can see there's like plenty of them. There's like so many of them that they don't fit on the slide. Um, so, uh, so basically, the point here is that this is a very active area. There's lots of people starting companies in the big data space, and there's a lot of venture capitalists funding them. Uh, so this is a very good area to be starting a company in if you want to, if you are an entrepreneur. Uh, but if, you, if your sort of eye is sort of zoning out of this, the important thing to realize is there are three broad categories. Uh, and those three broad categories are infrastructure, analytics, and intelligent applications. Right? So those are the uh, three classes to remember. Uh, infrastructure uh, consists of uh, things that are accessed primarily by developers. Uh, things like Hadoop and Spark and Storm and Cassandra, uh, Amazon Web Services. These are all uh, uh, infrastructure. Um, and the primary takeaway on infrastructure is that we have a good infrastructure right now uh, to build interesting applications. Uh, this has evolved over the last uh, 10 years or so. We've evolved a good infrastructure stack. A lot of people are migrating from Hadoop to Spark right now, uh, or to Storm. But, uh, and there's enough key value stores out there. So, uh, so I think there's a good infrastructure to, to create interesting data-driven apps. And uh, this is kind of not where the primary um, area of interest is for uh, either uh, uh, entrepreneurs or investors right now. So if, uh, because we have good infrastructure, uh, people's, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the entrepreneurial ecosystem has moved beyond infrastructure into applications at this point. So if you're going to start a company, uh, don't do infrastructure, do applications. Right? So, uh, well, if, you, if you're a researcher, by all means, you should, uh, you should do infrastructure. Uh, but I think uh, the, the, this is actually the, um, there are always hardware trends that are, that are changing. And in hardware trends change, there is uh, new, you know, you, it's possible that you can build new, uh, new layers of infrastructure, right? And um, this, this is what uh, Jan Stoika, who uh, built uh, Spark, was saying at VLDB as well. Because of hardware trend changes, um, you, you, know, you, can, you, you can do new things. So there, there it's, it's, it's possible uh, that you know, uh, the, 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 there's a new layer of infrastructure that can, uh, that can come around. So I think as a researcher, I think uh, infrastructure does make sense. Uh, but not so much as an entrepreneur, not right now. I think these things go in waves, right? Sometimes uh, the interesting thing to do is infrastructure. Sometimes the interesting things to do is applications. Right now, in the, in the uh, as an entrepreneur, the the uh, all the action seems to be around applications. The the second area is analytics, um, and uh, the. Uh, so analytics basically is data exploration, uh, either for data scientists or for end business users. Um, and, and I've sort of uh, given a few examples of analytics companies here, but I've grouped them into two groups. On the left-hand side of the vertical bar are companies like uh, Tableau and SaaS and H2O. These are what I call horizontal analytics companies, uh, companies that uh, um, uh, build a horizontal um, you know, analytics platform that are used by uh, that are useful for pretty much every industry vertical, useful for pretty much every business function. Um, uh, SaaS, uh, R example, is just another example that's kind of there, um, and so on, right? So uh, on, on the right-hand side uh, of, the, of the vertical bar are things, uh, companies like Palantir and ISD and Cubron. These build analytics platforms also, but they are extremely vertically focused, right? So uh, they are focused on specific uh, verticals or specific business functions. So Palantir is focused on defense and security, ISD on pharma, uh, Cubron on retail uh, and e-commerce, right? So uh, the the interesting thing, trend that that we are seeing right now in the in the in the VC and uh, startup space is more and more companies on on the right hand side, uh, right? Companies that that are focused on building. Analytics platforms for specific industries, uh, you know, verticals and specific uh, business functions, um, and largely because I think there is there is enough of the enough of the broadly uh, applicable companies right now that, that people are still digesting all the all the analytics tools that are available on the in, in the broad uh, broad segment. Right. So I'll give you an example of a vert of what I mean when I uh, say vertical analytics. This is Cubron, once again has uh, IIT founder. Uh, the, uh, this, the, a lot of companies use uh, things like uh, Google uh, Analytics uh, to track how their website or their mobile app is performing, how people are interacting with their, uh, uh, with their website or their mobile app. Um, and then uh, you get nice pretty charts like this, right? Uh, it turns out uh, this, this chart uh, tracks something called e-commerce conversion rate, which is a very important 
metric for an e-commerce company. It measures uh, of all the people who come to the website, how many of them actually end up buying something, right? So, uh, and that, that you can imagine is a very important metric for an e-commerce company. Um, and you can easily track it using things like Google Analytics or Omniture or Flurry. Uh, but what you can't do is when you see a spike like that, you don't know why it happened. Why did my conversion rate go up or go or burst? Why did it suddenly go down? Uh, is something that that you can't really tell uh, just from uh, just from this uh, fr fr just by tracking it, right? Uh, and in fact, a lot of time at uh, e-commerce companies uh, is spent uh, trying to understand why changes happen. And this is what's called uh, uh, root cause analysis. Um, and uh, there's uh, you know, and the, there are questions like why are signups changing? Uh, why did this uh, test perform or not perform, or things like that? Uh, most, you know, uh, product managers and most companies, most con you know, uh, end user facing companies spend most of their careers just uh, you know analyzing questions like this. And that's the kind of thing that uh, that that Cubron addresses. Uh, it takes uh, data from uh, from Google Analytics, which is which is private data, but it combines it with public data from uh, you know demographics from the U.S. Census Department and weather data uh, and so on and maps, uh, and then it builds very high dimensional data cubes. I'm sure uh, some of you may have studied about data cubes um, uh, in in your classes. So this. Uh, um, so what Cubron does is it builds these very high dimensional uh, data cubes, which are uh, 30 or 40 dimensional uh, data cubes. Um, and then uh, it's, it, it, it scans those data cubes to find anomalous subcubes within, within the data cubes. Um, and it turns out that the uh, anomalous subcubes uh, often have great uh, explanatory power, and they can often explain why uh, certain things happen. Why did conversion rate go down? For example, it may be that conversion rates went down uh, because uh, today there was suddenly a uh, lot of traffic uh, from a certain part of the world uh, that you know that you don't usually see, or or maybe uh, today there was uh, some kind of uh, a bug on the website, right? That was that was uh, so. Whenever there's an anomalous subcube, it's an anomaly, the something that new that happened, um, and these anomalous subcubes uh, often identify those uh, you know uh, identify those those, those problems. Um, the interesting thing is it's very hard to do this in, in a general purpose way because these uh, finding subcubes, um, anomalous subcubes within a high dimensional cube is, is a hard, uh, hard problem uh, because these cubes, as you know, are um, you know, very, very large and you, ca you, you can't exhaustively scan them. Um, so what Cuberon can do is that they can use domain knowledge about their domain to, uh, and to, to spot these anomalous subcubes very quickly. Right, so that was the uh, vertical analytics space. Um, so here's an example. Uh, so the next uh, next category is, uh, is, is what I call intelligent applications, and this is where most of the action is right now, right? So here are just some of the uh, examples. There are intelligent applications in, in in pretty much everything you can think of: sales and marketing, customer service, HR, security, right? Ads, uh, government. Uh, finance, life sciences, and you know, pretty much every industry or every business function you can think of, there is a data-driven intelligent app that's uh, that's being built in that uh, in that in that space. Um, and I'll just give you one example. Uh, this is an example of a company called Descartes Lab, um, and uh, they actually uh, use um, use satellite data, which we saw earlier. So uh, they use high-resolution re satellite data um, and uh, combine that with weather data. Uh, and what they do is that they predict crop yields, right? They predict, for in this case, it's corn yields. Uh, they're predicting how much corn um, it will be, uh, what's the total corn yield of the United States in this, in this upcoming year. And the interesting thing is they can not, do it uh, not just nationally, they can do it on a county by county basis. They can tell you what's the corn yield for this county going to be using satellite imagery and, uh, and, and weather data. Um, and uh, it, they, they have done some analysis that shows that they can do this prediction better than the U.S. government can. Uh, they, they, uh, the government does it by surveying farmers, um, and, uh, the, and, for, and nobody has this, uh, this county-level uh, forecast which, uh, which they have. Right? So, 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 so this, is, this, is a, uh, you know, this is a very specific app that's tuned for a very specific industry vertical uh, using certain kinds of data. So this is the kind of app that we see uh, you know, the, the being built, a lot of these kinds of apps. Right? So what's the overall uh, trends? Right? The overall trends is that uh, infrastructure is available and solid. There is a major transition from Hadoop to Spark. 
there's a, a lot of investment focus and a lot of entrepreneurial activity in this in this vertical analytics uh, place where you pick a a particular industry vertical or or, or you know or a business segment and you build an analytics platform just tuned for that uh, for that space um, and the third is the is this idea of intelligent apps where once again you pick a, a, a vertical or uh, um, uh, or, or, or industry segment, uh, and then you create an intelligent app like like Descartes Lab, and and there's lots of major, uh, lots of opportunity, major opportunity, and lots of investment dollars are flowing here. So if um, if you want to start companies, these are the areas to uh, to focus on. Truly is from IITB. Truly is IITB. Yes, actually, uh, if if I have time, I actually have them in an example. Truly, actually, it's two IITB founders. I think Anish Das Sharma and Nilesh uh, Dalvi. Yeah. So uh, so yes. Um, and Docs app is IIT Madras, so um, yeah. So um, so that was the end of the um, the um, investment landscape. Uh, the next part I'm I'm going to talk about this is this idea of disruption versus uh, optimization, um, and. Um, so let me let, let's first look at optimization, and then we look at disruption. Now, the the, the thing that's very hot at uh, lots of companies these days is this idea of uh, data lakes. Um, and a data lake is just uh, the next generation data warehouse. Uh, companies uh, gather all the data that they have inside the company and put this into this data lake so that they can do interesting analysis on the data, right? So uh, they can uh, they hire data scientists and uh, various people. Uh, to uh, data, uh, you know, uh, smart people like you uh, to analyze this data and build very interesting models. Maybe they use uh, a company, you know, a company like Hubron uh, or Descartes Lab to build these models. Um, and once they build these models, uh, then they can actually improve the, uh, you know, optimize the business, right? Uh, when I say optimize the business, they me they they can lower costs, they can reduce risk, or improve customer satisfaction, or improve quality. All these things are things you can do by analyzing all the data about the business, uh, and then uh, doing things to change how the business functions, and then you uh, you optimize the business. So this is something that that happens on a routine basis, um, and uh, hopefully when it when it happens, everybody's happy and the company's stock price keeps going up, right? So this is kind of the the overall. Uh, hope of many companies that are in this in this optimization space, and it works uh, to some extent. It works, and uh, th there are results. Um, but often, what happens uh, is that instead of this optimization, a different kind of thing happens, uh, and that is disruption. Right? So, uh, so Amazon comes along and disrupts uh, uh, Walmart. Right? Uh, this is dis despite uh, Walmart actually investing in building a data lake and get, hiring the analysts and doing all the optimization. It's not that they're not doing it, they are doing it, but they still get disrupted by an Amazon, right? So, uh, so Netflix comes along and they disrupts cable, this is in the, in the US, um, or uh, Uber comes along and they disrupt taxis, right? So, uh, so everybody's trying to optimize, but suddenly disruption, um, you know, they get disrupted, right? So, um, so why, does, um, why does this kind of disruption happen, right? So um, it's hard to answer the question in full generality, but I can give you some, um, um, you know some ideas around it, uh, and one of the uh, one of the key things is to think about established companies uh, or established industries and see how they think, right? Um, and uh, so, um, if you think about any big established company, big, large, bureaucratic established company, uh, and there is an important decision to be made, what they do is that they gather together. Uh, all the important stakeholders into a room, and they spend a lot of time analyzing the situation. And they use a very scientific uh, decision method. Uh, it's called the HIPPO to make uh, to make decisions. Right. So, um, do you know uh, what uh, what uh, what the HIPPO is? Uh, HIPPO stands for highest paid person's opinion. Right. So this is the uh, the, the the decision method used by most large. Not just companies; most most large organizations use this uh, use this uh, use this decision method, and this is one of the reasons, uh, you know, why companies are sometimes blindsided to change because they're ignoring the data and going by the highest paid person's opinion, right? So, uh, companies that uh, now, of course, there's lots of data available, um, and so companies can get better, right? So they should just not listen to opinion but look at data in making decisions. But there's a little gotcha there, right? Um, suppose uh, you know, clearly these companies are not uh, not stupid, so they are hiring data scientists. Um, so 
So what happens when, uh, when these large bureaucratic companies hire data scientists, right? They hire them as um, advisors rather than as decision makers. Uh, and so the highest uh, paid person uh, then just tells the data scientist to go make a PowerPoint presentation justifying their decision using data, right? So that's, uh, you know, uh, that's really what happens. So you get data-driven hippo, right? So, uh, so Maybe there's some historical context where a yeah. uh, lot of people didn't trust the data. Right. So you think it's garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. uh, so what has changed today? Right. Uh, do you think you can trust data more? I think there are many cases can't trust it. I mean, the, the example that I gave right at the beginning of this talk about coming here on time because I trusted Google uh, is, is a good example, right? I mean, about two or three years ago, I would actually, when I went to a new new city, I wouldn't trust Google. I'd ask uh, the local person for directions, especially in India, right? I mean, at food, so you would think Google had like, good data in India. So, uh, and then of course, they'd tell me all kinds of things that would be completely wrong, right? And I'd always get to meetings incredibly late. So. Um, and then I started trusting Google, and that stopped happening, right? So I think you know d data is getting better than human opinion in in many cases, especially when the world is changing very rapidly. It's hard for humans to keep up with everything, right? Whereas data can. I think that's the uh, that's that's the difference. So uh, so that's one, right? So the first uh, first uh, reason is that um, uh, many companies hire data scientists as advisors and not as decision makers, right? And they seem to think that domain expertise is more important than data. Um, I, it's, you ought to be very careful when, when thinking like this. Um, you know, uh, sometimes when you have enough data, you have to trust the data uh, and ignore your prior domain expertise. So I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something that, uh, that people have to learn to do over time. It's not always the case, but you have to know when to do it. Uh, the, the second is that um, the data-driven approach sometimes enables a completely new a business model that did that was not possible before, right? Uh, so when you if, when a startup comes along and truly sort of embraces the data-driven approach, they can use a new business model. Like you can do a la carte streaming versus a fixed number of channels in the case of Netflix, or or infinite inventory in the case of Amazon instead of a fixed number of stores, right? Um, um, and the third is this, uh, is this is a fear of making mistakes. Large companies and organizations have a fear of making mistakes. Um, and the problem is when you use a data-driven approach, uh, and this goes back to your point again, Sudarshan, is that um, you, when you deploy an algorithm to do something, algorithms can make mistakes. Right? Humans can make mistakes too, but algorithms can make even more spectacular mistakes. Um, and uh, for example, uh, let's say you know, um, a company, uh, company uses a an algorithm to decide how to price their product. Let's say a retailer uses this, right? Uh, it may be that the algorithm actually suggests reasonable prices for the product that uh, that work out well, but on, on a particularly busy shopping day, it set all the prices to some bad values and the company lost, lost a lot of money, right? So this could happen. And when this happened, uh, the, the company sort of says, I'm not gonna trust the data ever again, right? I'm, you know, I'll never do that again. But the problem is that algorithms learn by making mistakes, right? So you have to deploy the algorithm, let it make the mistakes, learn and get better over time. And algorithms get better by, you know, much faster, you know, than, than, than human beings can. Um, right, they, they can learn much faster with data than humans can. So, uh, in, in large organizations, there's always there's often a fear of making mistakes that prevents them from adopting uh, data-driven methods, which uh, you know, uh, which which enables uh, startups to some side sometimes come and succeed where where big organizations cannot. So, uh, so some of you may have heard of this uh, this book called The Innovator's Dilemma. Uh, it sort of explains why uh, disruption happens in a, in a very general sense. Written by this MIT uh, economist Clayton Christensen. So I uh, highly, uh, or, or maybe HBS, I don't know. I highly recommend that uh, those of you who have not read the book uh, but are interested in entrepreneurship or, or even in research, go read the book. It's, it's an excellent book. Uh, but uh, once you read the book, uh, the one thing that they don't mention that I think is new in this world is this idea of data network effects, right? So uh, the idea that look, when once you have a uh, um, you know, once you have somebody who uses uh, data uh, to make interesting decisions, uh, they initially start with a little bit of data, then they use the data to maybe, you know, make some decisions, then they get more data, their decisions get better, and overall, over time, they improve much faster. So this is what I call a data network effect. And these data network effects are sometimes quite rapid and, uh, and enable uh, startups to very quickly uh, become dominant companies before the incumbents uh, realize it. Right, so I'm going to give, use uh, the example I'm going to use for uh, for disruption. 
is, uh, is, is venture capital. Um, and venture capital, uh, you know, uh, it's been an established industry for a long time. Now, there are, it's, it's sort of uh, started in Silicon Valley, and this is where it's primarily based. Uh, most VC, most of the top VC firms are in Silicon Valley. Now, many, now there are many VC firms in India as well. Um, and, uh, you know, many of the Silicon Valley VC firms have offices in India, and there are uh, homegrown VC firms as well. Um, and uh, the, but the interesting thing about the VC industry is that their process has actually not changed that much. Uh, since the early days in the 1960s and 70s. Um, so the idea is that VC firms, you know, if you're a VC firm, you sort of uh, have a nice office, um, and you expect entrepreneurs to come and pitch you interesting ideas uh, periodically, and then you, you decide which of those ideas you like, and you end up funding those, uh, funding those companies. So this is pretty much the uh, way uh, VC firms work. Sometimes they use data. Um, they, they hire data scientists to actually crunch through uh, data from the companies that come and pitch them and try to validate them and so on. But those uh, data scientists are an advisory role, which is a red flag, uh, as we saw. Uh, they're not making decisions, right? So, um, so this is, um, sets the stage for my firm, which is Rocketship.vc, where we are actually trying to uh, disrupt venture capital using, using data, right? So, um, so the, uh, the basic idea that we're leveraging is that uh, there are many more startups all over the world. As I mentioned, Silicon Valley, venture capital firms are largely focused on Silicon Valley, and it's on a few other geographies now, including India. Um, but uh, now there are startups all over the world, and many more uh, startups, right? Um, so there's, uh, the, the, the costs of um, launching a startup are really low now, which means there are way more startups. Uh, there's, uh, um, you know, because of smartphones and because of the uh, app stores, uh, anybody anywhere in the world can uh, can launch an app and you know find a market all over the world, right? So this was not possible till a few years ago. Um, and um, the, there's uh, there's talent pools uh, in maybe a few hundred places in the world uh, of people who can start interesting uh, interesting companies. Even in India, uh, many of us think about places like Bombay and Bangalore, but there are people starting interesting companies in Chandigarh, right? So. Uh, so there's interesting uh, places uh, where, where people can uh, start companies. Um, and uh, there are uh, emerging uh, market opportunities, things like India, China, Brazil, uh, Indonesia, and so on, where there's interesting companies that you can start. So, the, so, the, um, so the, the number of companies, interesting companies now, is now beyond human scale. So we've actually built a database um, at Rocketship to, of, of all the companies in the world. Um, and uh, we've, we've sort of used some method to identify which of them are startups that we might be interested in funding. There are 2.1 million of them, right? So there are 2.1 million startups now, which no VC can can humanly sort of sift through 2.1 million startups. And it turns out that over 100,000 of those companies need funding at any point in time, right? That's a huge number. 90% uh, of these companies are not in Silicon Valley. They're actually outside Silicon Valley. Um, and uh, interestingly, it turns out, uh, if you look at the number of companies that are worth over a billion dollars, um, recently, the companies that were started outside Silicon Valley overtook the companies that were started in Silicon Valley for the first time. So there are more, more billion dollar companies that have been started outside Silicon Valley than in Silicon Valley for the first time. Right? So it's a good point to remember for those of you who want to start the next billion dollar company. Right? So, um, so this is um, so we so we can so this is what we do at Rocketship, right? We uh, there's lots of data available as well, right? There is now data about companies on places like the App Store, on the web, and so on. We can see how many downloads an app is getting, how people are reviewing and rating apps, for example, uh, if, if it is a if it is an app-driven company uh, or if it's another kind of company. There's other kind of data, and then you can you can also see direct customer feedback on companies from places like Facebook. What are the customers of the company actually talking about the company? Um, and uh, we can also look at LinkedIn to see who are the founders of this company, who are the senior team members, and what do we think about them. Um, and there's places like Crunchbase and AngelList and many other places uh, that actually have uh, information uh, on what are the new companies that are being started at any point in time. So if you so combine all these things, uh, you can actually build a model for the things that VCs care about, which are things like market, team, traction, competition, customer feedback, and so on. And then we can build a company model that tells you how likely is a company to succeed, right? Um, given given the capital, um, and using that company model, we make investments at at Rocketship, right? So this sort of changes the way a typical VC works. Uh, we use a data driven model to decide which companies to invest in. Now that's interesting, um, but that that by itself is not enough to disrupt the venture capital industry, right? To disrupt the venture capital industry, uh, as we saw earlier, you need not just a technological innovation, you also need a business model innovation. 
Um, and the way we do that is um, by flipping the VC business model on its head, right? Remember what I told you earlier about most VC firms, they waiting their nice offices, waiting for entrepreneurs to come in and pitch them. Uh, we change it, uh, and we, since we can, in, in parallel, uh, we can analyze all these um, uh, 2.1 million companies, uh, we figure out which are the interesting companies wherever they are in the world, and we reach out to them and ask them whether they would like us to be an investor, right? So, uh, so instead of the uh, entrepreneur pitching the venture capitalist, the VC pitches the entrepreneur in this case, uh, prior to them even reaching out to the uh, to, to the VC, right? So, so this sort of flips the whole uh, VC business model on its head, um, and um, so this uh, this this pie chart uh, shows you the geographies of the companies that we reached out to last quarter, um, in the last three months or so, and you can see that uh, that it's sort of very widely distributed because our database has data from companies all over the world. We reach out and make investments in companies. Uh, all over the world, and USSF, uh, is, which is Silicon Valley, uh, has only 11 percent, which is in line with the total number of startups in uh, in, in Silicon Valley, right? So, um, US other, for example, includes places like Rhode Island, where we actually have an investment where most VCs won't even bother looking. Uh, India, uh, we actually do have an investment in a startup based out of Chandigarh, where most VCs are not looking, right? So, uh, things like that, right? So, uh, in uh, Europe, we have investments, an investment in a company based, companies based out of Copenhagen and Barcelona. Um, so these are all interesting co companies that most VCs are not even looking at, but the data is telling us these are interesting, so we end up going and making investments in these, uh, in these companies. Right, so. Um, so what do you have all the data that you need to make? In the, for, for investments? Uh, so uh, it's, it's a two-step uh, process, um, and the first step is that we use all the data that we have available to find interesting companies. Uh, they, you know, we reach out to these companies, and then we ask them for their internal uh, metrics. Uh, usually their Google Analytics or their Flurry or whatever it is that they're using internally to track. So we then look at that and validate that with our own data, and then we make investment decisions. Right, so. Yeah, and the interesting thing is we make more, many of our investment decisions without ever meeting the entrepreneur in person, right? Because they are spread all over the world. Usually it's over like a Skype call or something like that, right? So it's, uh, so it's a very different, uh, different uh, business model. Um, so, the, so to summarize, the, uh, the key uh, two themes that we've seen here are optimize versus disrupt. Optimize takes an existing business or a business model, usually an established business, uses data to make it better, right? Uh, disrupt takes an established industry or a business model um, and finds a new way of doing it, right? So uh, usually for the better, right? So these are the two, uh, two key uh, ideas that we've seen. And for a, the, the key question that every entrepreneur has to think about uh, and, uh, and every researcher too sometimes uh, is should, should I be optimizing or should I be disrupting, right? Should I make, build a product that helps an existing group of businesses optimize their business or should I be starting a new class of businesses that blows away the existing class of businesses, right? So this is a very important question uh, that, that you have to think about. Um, and uh, it sort of often you know, determines whether you succeed or fail. Uh, and this is kind of a hard question to answer in general, uh, but um, you, know, you look for some disruption cues. You know, is, is it an established and fragmented industry? Well, then maybe you might want to disrupt it, right? Are they slow to adopt latest technology trends? Uh, are there, are there asset-heavy models that you can replace with asset-light models? For example, uh, the, the existing business models use assets, very expensive assets like retail stores or taxi medallions or uh, things of this nature. Can you replace them with an asset-light model using data, right? So that's that worth thinking about. Um, and the uh, final thing to think about is this idea of uh, risk-reward trade-off, right? It's uh, disrupting an established industry. It's, very, it's a very risky thing to do, right? So many try, very few succeed. Um, whereas optimizing is, is sort of a much lower risk proposition. You can probably make a few sales um, and uh, into, in, into an established uh, industry. Um, on the other hand, when you do disrupt, uh, the rewards are much, much higher, right? Uh, you know, think of the valuation of an Uber or a Netflix or an Amazon versus um, you know many companies that are that are trying to optimize, right? So, so the rewards are much much higher. The risks are also much much higher. So, so it's at the end of the day, it it might even be a matter of personal preference, right? Based on your own risk reward profile, do you 
uh, want to disrupt or do you want to optimize, right? So just uh, it's a very important question to, to think about. And I do hope that many of you, when you start companies, end up starting disruptive companies, not just companies that optimize existing business, because that's where a lot of uh, uh, value needs to be created. And even when you do research, uh, sometimes it's interesting to think about um, research ideas that sort of open entirely new fields of work, um, uh, you know, or, or sort of uh, question, uh, you know, establish wisdom in some way, as opposed to just taking a published paper that somebody published and then tweaking it a little bit. And so that's the that's, that's example of optimization versus uh, disruption in the case of research, right? So uh, even in the case of research, uh, I hope some of you will uh, think about doing disruptive research rather than research that optimizes, right? An example of disruptive research is, things, is something like self-driving cars, right? Uh, so that disrupted rather than purely optimizing something that came previously. Um, let's see, human-machine collaboration. OK. Uh, so I've skipped one uh, section. I'm, I'm moving to uh, this, this section, this theme uh, that I call the rise of the cyborg. Um, cyborgs are always exciting, so I wanted to talk about them. So uh, there's, uh, on a daily basis, right, we interact with a lot of data-driven software, right? So uh, a typical user would interact with, uh, with Facebook, with Amazon, with Twitter, with Google, with Netflix, with, and all these companies um, actually are data-driven companies. They use, uh, they build uh, data-driven models of their users and interact with their, with their users. They make recommendations. Uh, or they reorder search results, or they show a news feed in a specific order, depending on models they have of their, of their users, right? So we're all used to this, so we don't even give a second thought to this thing. Um, but perhaps we should, right? So uh, because there's something called uh, the agency problem that we should all be aware of, right? If you think about all these companies, whether it's a Facebook or a Netflix or an Amazon or a Google, uh, they, they build models of users, uh, but you know, the, the, we, we, uh, we often think that these models are optimized for our benefit, but that's not the case. Each model is optimized for the benefit of the company that created the model, right? So Google's uh, models are optimized for Google, Netflix is for Netflix, and so on, right? So they have certain business objectives that they are trying to optimize by building models of uh, you and me, right? Um, and very often, uh, our goals and the goals of the company that build the, build the model uh, are aligned, but sometimes they are not. Right? So most of the time they're aligned, so we don't need to worry about it. But sometimes the, 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 our goals and the goals of the company uh, are not necessarily aligned. So it's worth uh, thinking about this, uh, this, this agency problem uh, sometimes. Yeah? So what's the, uh, what are the problems that, that arise because of this agency uh, uh, problem? Uh, the first is uh, privacy. Clearly, everybody has your data and their building models, whether you like it or not. Uh, the second is uh, this idea of pricing and discovery disadvantage, right? So uh, you can only select from among the choices that are shown to you, right? Um, and if, uh, if, if a company uh, uses, uh, or a service that you interact with, uses a data-driven model to decide these are the items that I'm going to show you in this order, you can only decide among the first n items they show you, because you're not ever going to go beyond that, right? So, um, so you're sort of at a, you know, at some level, they're performing a service for you in, in, by trying to guess what you might like and ordering things. But at some level, you're also captive to the choices that they have made in terms of what they're going to show you. Um, and uh, the, uh, there's also a pricing issue because clearly they can build models of how price sensitive you are and uh, take advantage of that uh, by showing you products at certain price levels and not at other price levels. Um, and the, uh, the other uh, interesting uh, thing is that um, most of these companies are building population models and are optimizing it for their own ends, uh, and your ends may not be the same as their ends, right? So it may be worth, uh, worth, worth thinking about. Um, and so the research community, uh, this, remember this talk was addressed to the research community, has actually uh, helped create this problem by creating fantastic algorithms like matrix factorization and um, you know, um, multi-arm bandit and uh, neural networks and so on. Uh, deep learning and so on for, for companies, but they, we've created zilch for, for users, right? Uh, we've created all kinds of interesting algorithms for companies to use, not nothing so exciting for users to use, uh, right? So and I think therein lies an opportunity, right? Uh, it may be interesting to create algorithms for people who currently don't have algorithms, as opposed to for people who already have a ton of algorithms, right? That could be a very interesting uh, opportunity, whether you are in the research space or whether you want to start a company. So, um, so for example, so in this fight right between companies and, and people, the, the companies are actually armed with these uh, 
uh, guns and steel, whereas humans are armed with wooden weapons. And when those two meet, the you know the ending is always kind of predictable, um, right? So uh, so how do you solve this problem? Well, you could solve this problem using uh, this idea of of a cyborg, right? So uh, cyborgs are very cool. Um, and so basically, the idea is that you replace the user uh, with a cyborg. And what's a cyborg? A cyborg is just a layer that separates the user from the data-driven services that they interact with, right? So there, there's, there's an extra, the, we let's just add a layer, which is a personalized model uh, of the user. And that's actually built uh, entirely on behalf of the user using the user's entire data. Um, and have that layer interact with the data-driven services as opposed to having the user directly interact with them. Yeah. So, uh, so what kind of layers, uh, services could the cyborg layer provide? Well, it could provide privacy protection. Uh, there is a very interesting idea called differential privacy that's, uh, that's going around. Read about it if you don't know about it already. Uh, the idea is that uh, the cyborg can um, um, choose to reveal certain information to the uh, to Facebook or Netflix and not choose certain uh, choose to reveal certain other uh, information, or maybe it can obfuscate the information slightly, maybe make up a few, few few searches that you never made, but pretend like they came from you, just to fool the other service into thinking that you have certain preferences and uh, the, the, you know that you didn't have. Um, uh, you can st strategically spread your interactions across services. For example, you can buy certain products from Flipkart and some from Amazon, thereby making sure that neither of them builds a full model of you. Right, so uh, th things of that, uh, things of that uh, nature. Right, so um, the 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 other interesting thing you can do is uh, is around discovery and pricing, right? Because a cyborg can actually look at a much larger selection than than you can, um, and uh, you know you, you can um, yeah, and it can pick uh, the items that it thinks are uh, appropriate for you, acting strictly as your own agent, not the company's agent. It didn't pick the the more expensive items, for example, if you're in the mood for uh, cheaper items, or it, or it might, you know, it might know certain things about you that the company does not know. For example, the cyborg might know that you have an upcoming business, uh, trip, which Amazon doesn't know, and therefore it can decide that it needs to buy certain products for you, right? So uh, things of this, uh, things of this nature, right? Uh, and this is the uh, key idea. The idea is that the cyborg can combine a personal model that has been built for you using all your data uh, with with the population model that the company has, right? So here's uh, here's a graphic that helps understand this. Here's a user. A uh, user interacts with uh, with Amazon, right? Um, and Amazon builds a model for, of the of the user. Now the interesting thing is that Amazon um, has information from millions of users, not just this one user. Uh, and therefore, if you if they had to figure out if if this user bought a certain book, what are the books they're likely to buy? Amazon will do a great job because they have information from millions of users, whereas uh, this poor user has only information about themselves, right? So they're not likely to do much. You know, Amazon's probably going to do much better than this user. But the interesting thing is, Amazon only knows this user's purchase information, right? Whereas this user is doing many other things in their life other than purchasing products, right? They they probably have calendar, they have email, they they have Facebook, they have Twitter, they have you know many other things in their lives that are going on other than purchasing products. And the cyborg knows all these things not just the products. And therefore, the cyborg can combine all this information with just, they can just take the things that Amazon knows well and combine it with all the other information the cyborg knows well and overall do a better recommendation for the, uh, for the user. Right? So, so that's what the cyborg can do. A cyborg can combine um, its um, information that only the user has with information that only Amazon has to make even better decisions. Right? Combine personal and population models. So I think there's a very interesting disruptive research and business opportunity. Uh, if any of you want to kind of do uh, uh, research on this, uh, you know, uh, I, you know I'm, I'm happy to uh, uh, be, you know, co-advise you from afar if you can find a local advisor because I'm personally interested in this uh, in this topic. So, uh, how much is this easier? If platform like a browser. Mm -hmm. uh, but once you have these things encapsulated inside apps, mm -hmm. uh, isn't it pretty hard for uh, you to create an agent which can actually dig deeper than you know, just the surface of the app? No, I think that's, that's a very valid question. I think um, uh, over time, and this is place hard, I think you might, you might want to start with uh, websites. Uh, pretty much every, every, every service that has an app also has a, a website, right? So I don't think that it's going to be that much of a challenge. Uh, but the other, I think over time, 
uh, when these uh, as these agents become uh, popular and become the established way of doing business, uh, I think companies will expose APIs for uh, for such cyborgs over time, uh, and not just for humans. I think, and may, maybe it'll happen in five years, maybe it'll happen in ten. But it, that's I think that's uh, that's what's going to happen, right? So I think maybe as researchers we have to anticipate uh, the future. Sometimes you'll be wrong and sometimes you'll be right, but it's worth you know having the fun, right? So. Um, so that's pretty much the, wait, let me just do the conclusion. Um, oh, maybe I should, uh, oh, well, maybe, just to have fun, maybe I'll talk about Truly without uh, having any context whatsoever. Truly, so here's an example of, of, of another interesting, very interesting data-driven uh, company. Where is it? It's not even coming up. Oh, there you go. So I'm, I'm using this company as an example of an interesting uh, data-driven company uh, because it's, uh, it has two IIT Bombay founders, very interesting company. Uh, Anish Dasarma and Nilesh Dalvi are the two IIT Bombay founders. And um, this sort of uh, is sort of motivated by this uh, idea that uh, the need for online trust has, uh, has grown uh, dramatically, um, right? Whereas in 2005, we were uh, sort of buying things uh, online now in 2015 we are sort of sharing experiences with strangers right so we might be uh, renting a house from somebody on Airbnb or renting our house to some some someone on Airbnb uh, share it, take, taking a ride on uber or interacting with someone on tinder or something of this of this nature right so um, and uh, so these experiences are somewhat personal and so the, the the question that truly is motivated by is would you rent your house to a stranger to this stranger right so it's kind of scary when you when you think about it right and this guy can come and they, he might trash your house or do something really bad in your house, right? So, uh, so how do you know whether you, you trust this person to rent their house? And this was this problem that that truly addresses. Um, and uh, they they do this by uh, looking at a lot of data about users based on uh, their their um, public um, data footprints, right? They look at what what people are saying on social media, what they you know what they've been reviewing on Yelp, um, uh, what they you know. Uh, what information can you find about them on Google? What uh, what information can you find about them on LinkedIn? Right? Um, uh, criminal records. They go do a search for uh, uh, any criminal records that they can find about this person. So they combine all this to come up with uh, with what they call a trust score for a person for an individual. And that trust score that you can uh, you can use that trust score to decide whether somebody is trustworthy enough to rent for you to rent your house. So it's a very very interesting data driven application. That sort of, um, in in a way, here data is removing friction, right? So you know, normally we don't like to do you know certain things with strangers, but if the data tells you that you can trust this person, you're more likely to do it, right? So so uh, in this case, data is in some way removing friction uh, from the world, right? So it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting example of uh, of a company. So let's go to the conclusion. I'll just jump ahead to the conclusion. So uh, we were waiting for that. Yeah, so to conclude, so we looked at these uh, five generations of data-driven applications. Uh, we looked at some lessons and opportunities, this idea of intelligent apps being the place to, uh, to be right now, uh, this idea of disruption versus optimization, and why disruption is sometimes much more exciting to, uh, to do than, than optimization. We look, uh, looked at cyborgs and saw that as a very interesting disruptive opportunity that some of you can hopefully pursue. Um, and the last piece of this uh, relates to what uh, Professor Fatak was talking about, this idea that we have silos, right, uh, in, in academia sometimes, right? We think of, uh, and this talk was given to the data man management community at VLDB, um, and there's data management, there's information retrieval, there's AI, there's data mining, there's systems, and so on. There are all these silos uh, in, in the academic uh, research world. Right, uh, and all the, each all these silos have the have had this problem uh, that that's called marketing myopia, right? Um, and uh, the the idea is this, right? Um, uh, this idea was coined by by this guy called uh, Theodore Levitt back in 1960 in a Harvard Business School case study. Highly recommended reading. Uh, and the anal the example that he used uh, is this uh, is the uh, comes from the uh, early part of the 20th century uh, in America, 
when railroads were the dominant form of transportation, this is before airlines, railroads were the dominant form of transportation in the early part of the century. Um, and uh, they were the king of the, you know, the world and the stock market and so on, the railroad companies. Uh, suddenly, airlines started appearing, right? It, you know, it became safer to fly. Uh, after the Second World War, uh, more and more airlines started appearing. I mean, more, more and more people started uh, flying rather than taking trains. Um, and uh, the railroad companies were looking at this and said, you know what, should we invest in or buy these airline companies? Um, and should we get into the airline business ourselves? And so the railroad company said, no, 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 we are in the railroad business, we are not in the airline business. Um, and then what happened? Uh, now railroads are somewhat irrelevant and uh, airlines have become the dominant form of transportation, at least in the, in the US, and it's happening in India even now. Um, so the interesting thing is the railroad companies were looking at the world through the lens of their product, which was the railroads, right? Uh, they should have instead been looking at the world through the lens of their customers, Right, and said, look, we are not in the railroad business, we are in the transportation business. And we should, you know, go, we should be in the business, in the, the, we should be in the most efficient form of transportation that's available to, uh, to customers, as opposed to saying we are in the railroad business and not in the transport, you know, not in the, not in the airline business, right? So, um, so a lot of academic disciplines um, have this uh, problem of looking at the world through the lens of their product, whether it's data management or artificial intelligence or systems or, uh, you know, whatever it is, and or computer architecture, or whatever it is, right? So they think this, uh, they, they, there are certain boundaries to, to their world, but that's not the way the world works, right? So solving any particular problem requires looking at the problem through the lens of the customers and the users of the product, and that often requires combining ideas from multiple disciplines, as Professor Fatak was saying, and um, coming up with, uh, with, with, with solutions, right? And the, the key uh, uh, way, perhaps, I think, to look at the world right now is that we, uh, we live in a data world, right? So there's, uh, data sort of impacts every aspect of, of humanity, of, of human endeavor right now, right? There's, if you think of entertainment or education or science or security or manufacturing or government or commerce or transportation, uh, everything is impacted by data and data-driven approaches right now. Um, and so there's, there's plenty, of, uh, plenty of opportunity to apply data to do interesting things if we can ignore these silos about systems and AI and da data management and architecture and so on, and just think about how to take data and impact uh, you know, every aspect of, of human endeavor right now, right? Uh, and for many of you, I think uh, the interesting thing is many of these things, uh, whether, whether it's government or manufacturing or security or sciences, are often stuck in some kind of local maxima where they've been doing business as usual without using data. And now when suddenly data comes along, there's a chance to shock them out of their local maxima into, into a much better space, just like um, you know, Amazon came and shocked shopping out of a local maxima. Um, and as data scientists or, or people who work with data, we have the opportunity to be the, the change agent, to go there, use data, and uh, transform each of these fields, right? Uh, so we should sort of think of ourselves as data plus X, right? All of us should understand data-driven methods, but we should also understand how some of these other fields work, whether it's security or government or commerce, and come up with uh, ways of applying data in a disruptive fashion to many of these fields, not just to optimize these fields, but to disrupt them, right? And I think the, there's huge opportunity uh, to do so, okay? So with that, I'll, I'll end my talk right there. Uh, we have time for some questions about the talk, and after that, uh, any other questions that you want. Hi. So, what I've been noticing is, as we sort of mature along this curve of the digital world, mm -hmm. right, so there's a lot of concerns that people are expressing about privacy, some of the stuff that we thought about already, mm -hmm. but more so about the digital footprint that we're leaving behind. Maybe we don't want that. Many of us don't want that, right? Um, many people who are really smart, intelligent people that I know are now sort of withdrawing from the digital world and saying, I don't want to have this footprint. It's becoming too intrusive into my life. Sure. The question is, um, will there be regulation that's soon going to come that will limit the availability of this data in the way that we're seeing it today. It's sort of fairly open. People are monetizing data in ways that we never thought uh, you know, they would be doing. Mm -hmm. But will regulation drive some of that moving forward? So 
Yes, I said the answer is in two parts, right? I think, um, and yes, there will be regulation, there already is regulation. For example, Europe has much stronger national privacy laws than, uh, than the US, for example. Uh, so there will be um, some regulation that comes along. But I tend to believe that this is a, a problem that has been created by technology and to some extent has, can be addressed through technology as well, uh, using this idea that, that I spoke about, right? We have armed companies with these methods Right, and so that, that, that's caused, that is causing the privacy problem. Perhaps if we arm ourselves and ordinary citizens with the same data-driven methods, right, then we can be on an equal footing with the companies and decide what to share with the companies and what not to share with the, uh, with the companies and make intelligent uh, decisions about that. Right, so, so part, I think part of the solution is going to come from regulation and, and uh, part of me that um, hopes that a large part of the solution is going to come from technology itself. talked about the cyborg model whereby for the first time something would be from the side of something would be on the side of customers instead of on the side of revenue generators mm -hmm. but uh, taking like the past examples in case such as even your product jungly was supposed to be something which compared prices from different websites so that's not something which you know promotes any particular firm but uh, after all a startup's job comes down to generation of revenue and the revenue comes from the big firms. So do you think something like that is a viable idea because giving example of uh, cases like Zomato or rating services which are in general, uh, we have been hearing a lot of cases whereby the promotion of some particular firm happens due to the back end funds or something. So how to prevent those kind of cases or like, do you think some firm which does not promote any already established firm and does a job from the side of consumers, mm -hmm. does it have enough market to exist on its own? That's a good question. question. I think the, the Zomato example is very apt, right? Zomato and even Yelp have had similar accusations in the in the past, right? So, um, so uh, I, yeah, I think it, it, once again, it's the, the agency problem is best I think solved using um, using the appropriate business model, right? So the company that, uh, for example, the cyborg idea, right? Uh, one way to, this can be implemented in a way that um, uh, that works is through open source, for example, right? Just, just as Linux was created in the open source and is available to everybody. So hopefully somebody can create a cyborg OS in, in open source and it can be available to, to everybody, right? In which case, it's not a commercial undertaking. So that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it uh, in, a, in a commercial manner is for a company to have a business model that's aligned with their end users. So for example, if the company's business model consists of, you know, you will pay a, a subscription, monthly subscription fee, that's it, right? I'm not going to show you ads, I'm not going to sell you products, right? Then I'm entirely on your side, right? If, if, the, if the business model of the company is entirely aligned with end users, as opposed to being dependent on something like commerce, that that's another way to to build something like like a cyborg, right? So the only revenue should come directly from the users, and it should be a fixed revenue, right? So. Mm -hmm. so most of the times, when uh, in such presentations or uh, data lectures, we often get to look at the side uh, which is probabilistically more possible. As in, data tends to be probabilistically more accurate in predicting mm -hmm. uh, instead of not. But sir, as a VC yourself, you must have had times when data did not work out, as in you predicted something and it did not happen. So how do you deal with those cases? Because we never get to see all those stuff in such presentations. Can you share some experience of yours whereby some prediction of yours failed and how do you deal with that? Then? That's an excellent question. Now it's very uh, easy, hard for me to talk about uh, in, as a VC, at least with rocket ship, to talk about prediction that failed because we've only been around for a short time, right? So it's very hard for me to, so we made these investments. Uh, about a year, uh, year and a year and a half ago, and it's, all these companies are still around. When one of these companies fails spectacularly, I'll know that uh, I made a mistake. But that hasn't happened yet because it's been a short time. I'm sure some of them will fail, right? So, uh, so it's hard to tell. But um, I, um, I think it will be it will be true that uh, the data is only probabilistically correct. So therefore, I think the philosophy when dealing with the data-driven approach is to use a a statistical approach, right? So if, if you're an investor, um, you sh if, and if you're using data to make investments, you should not make one investment because you should you should make 50 investments, right? Uh, because you know if you make 50 investments and all of them have a certain probability of being right, 
then you're more likely to be closer to the mean of the, uh, the predicted uh, success. So, uh, so whenever you use data, uh, the philosophy is always use a statistical method. I think making, using data to make one-off decisions is, is a dangerous uh, path to go down, right? I think data should only be used to make statistical decisions rather than one-off decisions. If you're making one-off decisions, I think sometimes intu intuition is, uh, is a better path than, than data, but... Uh, you should use data to choose your life partner. Perhaps not, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although I've known enough people who've done that too, but... Uh, they <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I, th I think that's probably the wrong... Uh, the, the wrong approach. I think a lot of people use a statistical method using dating uh, services like Tinder, right? So that is a statistical approach because you're sampling a large population, right? So, uh, so in that case, you can convert a one-off decision into a statistical decision. <laughs> no. Question? Hi. My name is Derek. Uh, specifically, uh, in the IoT space, right, uh, you just touched upon it. There are a lot of uh, issues with the uh, standards. There is no common standard and everybody is fighting together. The ICANN, ITU, mm -hmm. you know, and there are a lot of power centers uh, coming in. So, uh, do you see, uh, would you, would you uh, advise, say, you know, hold on for a while till standards are set up, you know, just wait till the chaos is over and then, you know, uh, get on to that space? Uh, or would you see something, uh, you know, some sort of an integration of standard, one standard coming up like an IP version 4, 6, which standardizes the whole communication media. Uh, what's your take on that? Uh, the other question is, uh, on your uh, fun, easy disruption idea, there are a lot of startups coming up in the, uh, you know, you know, some sort of a stock exchange for startups, you know, listed uh, growth potential startups who can be listed and then they can be traded off. Some sort of a reverse uh, start, uh, you know, disruption where these platforms reach the startup than startup uh, reaching the reason. So are you going to take this concept further and you just put that like, like for example, Grex, these are some startups from India who are in the same platform, GREX and all that. So I will take this. So, uh, on uh, Internet of Things and standards, I'm not hugely familiar with the standards in the in the IoT space, so I don't know uh, the exactly what's going on in that uh, in that space. IoT has been one of these uh, spaces for me, but personally, uh, where I think there's a lot of promise, but not very much has has actually uh, happened in terms of uh, you know uh, end uh, end results. Except you know, I'm sort of seeing. Um, some early, um, uh, you know, early signs, you know, uh, in some some of the bigger companies like GE are doing, you know, investing a lot in uh, in, in IoT kind of things. So, if I if I were a startup uh, right now, uh, what I would do is I'd sort of go work with some early adopter type companies like like a GE or something like that, and sort of try to solve a real problem. Um, and then, you know, by the time the standards evolve, you probably have acquired a bunch of domain knowledge already. So that's probably what I would do. If I were in this uh, in this space right now, uh, just go solve the problem and not worry about the standards for now. The uh, on the other thing uh, about the um, um, uh, the 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 this stock exchange type model for for private companies, right? So there are things like second market and so on, uh, and these tend to focus on later stage companies. Typically, these are companies that uh, are very late stage startups, startups that have. Uh, Raised hundreds of a few hundred million dollars already, or you know, and then they are they're sort of semi-public, semi-private type type companies, right? So they could they are not yet public, but they are big enough potentially that they could be, and they are all listed on these these kinds of uh, exchanges. And I think uh, that's an interesting idea, but there are not enough enough startups of that nature, right? I mean, the, if you look at the millions of startups that that we look at, maybe there are a few hundred that are in that in that category. So that's a very small sliver of, of, of the startup world. Question? You have shown a chart where the investments in different geographies. Yeah. Why is it that in India the investment is lesser than most of the when it is lesser than South America? Yeah. We reached out to not necessarily our investments. Uh, I didn't have time to get the actual investment thing. So this is our reach out. Uh, but the in terms of um, investments, actually, we have. Uh, more in India now than in Latin America, I think. 
uh, one of the reasons why, frankly, uh, we until recently we had uh, we had not made that many investments in India uh, is that I think the valuations were out of control in India. I think uh, there was a little bit of a bubble, uh, and uh, valuations um, have been um, unrealistically high uh, in India, uh, driven by uh, some unrealistic. E uh, Valuations in the e-commerce and uh, you know ride-sharing, you know Ola type spaces. So that was driving up all kinds of startup valuation. Now so I think valuation is settling down to a more reasonable level in India, and so we have you know we've been making more investments in India. Valuations, valuations were unreasonable in India. They were very high, too high, until uh, until last year. You know companies were overvalued uh, based on uh, you know companies such as in the e-commerce space, uh, such as Flipkart and Snapdeal and Ola, these are all overvalued and they were driving up the valuation of the overall space. And so that means that we didn't want to invest at those high valuations, we were waiting for the valuations to come down. So now we are investing in India. Probably several more questions, but what I would suggest is, uh, those of you who need to leave uh, can leave now, and those who want to ask a few more questions, come up and ask them. Uh, so let's again uh, thank Arnold for a wonderful talk.